Hi everyone, this is Elaine. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm here today with Megan Kirk-Chang who will be speaking to us all about trauma on the brain and the body. Megan is a PhD candidate in health sciences at York University, specializing in behavior change, mental performance, psychophysiology, and cognitive neuroscience. As part of her doctoral research, Megan has developed the first registered clinical trial in Canada investigating the effectiveness of an online mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral intervention for adults diagnosed with PTSD. Megan has now launched this evidence-based program, Heal My Trauma, globally to help people repair the physical and mental disruption caused by trauma or hardship. She is a certified trauma-informed yoga teacher and meditation facilitator on the Insight Timer app, the number one free meditation app for sleep, anxiety, and stress. Megan, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm so grateful. And I, I just want to acknowledge the work that Blue Matter Project does by making mental health services and resources accessible. I think now more than ever, uh, we need organizations like you. So I'm really grateful. Thank you. I am a huge fan of the research that you're doing at the moment, and I loved hearing about your results in your research. Uh, before we dive into that today, I'd love it if you could first tell us why and how you started on this journey, and why specifically uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. So I, I had briefly mentioned to a few people who were on um, early that about five and a half years ago, I was in, you know, the dream job, the full-time permanent with benefits career that I saw myself retiring in. Um, and about two months into that role, my now husband was in just a fluke random accident while he was playing a pickup game of football. And uh, in what felt like a matter of seconds, we found ourselves in the back of an ambulance on our way to Sunnybrook hospital for those of you that don't know Sunnybrook hospital that's where you know very big trauma cases go across the province and um we were signing dnr forms and he was scheduled to go right into spinal cord surgery um that as soon as we got there and what was interesting is what was supposed to be a two-hour surgery ended up being over eight hours long and inherently that was traumatic as well and there was no um there was no personnel that came to inform us why there was a delay um so my mind went to obvious places um and when he came out of surgery and we came home throughout his recovery what was really interesting for me was i noticed a lot of physical symptoms within myself um, things like night sweats, nightmares, um, on, sudden onset of panic or anxiety attacks. And it was interesting to me because I wasn't actually at his football game. I wasn't present. I didn't see it happen. Um, I drove to get him because no one thought to call an ambulance. Um, and I started to get curious. I started to get really curious about why when I wasn't the actual person involved, am I experiencing this whole host of physical symptoms? And so it was through that experience that I um, had been working in cancer prevention. I had reached out to um, a clinician scientist that is from York University to acknowledge his work. And long story short, I quit my full-time permanent cushy job to pursue my PhD in studying the physical effects of trauma um, because I, I felt like there's got to be something here. Um, so in a nutshell, here I am. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think far too often uh, we, in general, we think of post-traumatic stress disorder um, viewed as sort of a, a veterans only condition. Um, I'd love it if you could give us a brief understanding of what PTSD is and maybe even explain the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD for anybody who isn't familiar. Yeah, so really great question and I really like what you said about how we've typically viewed PTSD as a veterans only uh, condition because that's where originally the clinical diagnosis emerged from. So 
Post-traumatic stress disorder is actually a clinically diagnosed disorder that's recognized by the DSM-5. So the DSM is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual, which is developed and created by the American Psychiatric Association. This um, condition, PTSD, was originally created for men, or typically white men, uh, coming home from the Vietnam War. And at the time, the, uh, the chair or the board of the American Psychiatric Association consisted predominantly of white men. So I think it's really important here, especially during the times that we're in, to acknowledge that the clinical diagnosis of PTSD doesn't always reflect the live, lived experience of many underrepresented groups, such as people of color or women or people with disabilities. Um, but basically where we're at is that PTSD has a specific criterion uh, to meet and has a specific manifestation of symptoms that result from exposure to uh, what's deemed a life-threatening trauma. So the symptoms are categorized based on, you know, intrusion, so disturbing memories or flashbacks, um, avoidance, so avoiding thoughts, avoiding people or places that remind you of your trauma, negative cognition and mood. So this is like your distorted self-blame or self-beliefs, arousal and reactivity. This is, you know, that feeling of being on guard, angry outbursts, etc. Symptoms generally have to last longer for longer than a month. Um, and not everyone that has gone through a trauma will have a PTSD diagnosis. So that sort of post-traumatic stress disorder, and hopefully that was succinct, but what I really think uh, needs to be more recognized is this idea of complex PTSD. Um, so complex PTSD recognizes that trauma in some individuals, and I would argue most if not all, may in fact be repeated, prolonged, multifaceted, uh, where the symptoms that emerge from multiple exposures to trauma uh, are a little bit more complex. So it might be a combination of, you know, arousal reactivity symptoms, but in conjunction with depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, etc. Now, C CPTSD isn't recognized as a clinical disorder, so um, it implicates a lot of people who might be walking around thinking that they have something, but there's no clinical way that they can actually find out about their diagnosis. So you can kind of see the problem that we're in, in terms of identifying these. So hopefully that sums it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think that was such a great uh, distinguish between the two of them. Um, and, you know, I think that trauma really has the ability to deeply imprint and encode our mind and our body. Um, it can almost feel like a haunting whisper that sort of lingers and keeps our nervous system on alert. Um, you know, our nervous system, it's almost as if our nervous system is constantly evaluating safety and danger and, and threat and risk. Um, I would love if you could talk to us about what happens to the brain after trauma and how that shows up in our physiology, like our, our nervous system response. Mm -hmm. I love, I love your terminology of this haunting whisper. That's, I, like, I felt that when you said that. Um, so it's interesting and, and you know, depending on your beliefs and, and the work that you've done in uncovering what trauma is, we're all going to have a bit of a different perspective. But I, I really do believe uh, that trauma is first experienced physically, um, that it is a physical response first, and then the cognitive, emotional, psychological impact comes afterwards. Um, so some of the things that I'm really interested in uncovering, and I think more and more research is being um, examined in this area is looking at the physical impact of trauma. So I won't dive into too many um, scientific words at the moment, but, and I know that you have graciously posted my trauma brain quick guide on your Instagram profile. Um, and that just is a very high level overview of some of the regions of the brain that get impacted by trauma. So Two of the regions that I really want to focus on um, 
first of all, is the amygdala. And we, we know the amygdala is our emotional hijack system. So this is the area of the brain that processes our physiological, so our body, our musculoskeletal system, so our ability to move, um, and our autonomic responses based on an emotional response. So our amygdala helps us detect fear and threat. Like it is our, our threat detector. And when we experience trauma of any kind, uh, it causes the amygdala to actually become overactivated. So more blood flow goes to this area to overactivate it. And basically what that means is that everything starts to feel like a threat. So one of the things that I want to kind of deconstruct with listeners is that this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, your amygdala is crucial for your survival. And so we need to start viewing this overactivation and um, seeing things as a threat, as a positive thing, because it's really your body trying to do its job. Um, where it gets problematic is if we don't kind of check in to, okay, that wasn't actually a threat, but I'm responding as if it were. Um, that's where it gets problematic. So the amygdala is, is the big one. Um, Another area that many people might not have heard of before that to me is probably one of the most fascinating is the impact of tra trauma on the Broca's area. Um, actually, one of my past clients referred to this as uh, the broken area, and I thought that that was so powerful to remember. Um, so Broca, B-R-O-C-A. This is a very, very small area of the brain uh, that's responsible for our language and our articulation. So think of your ability to put words to your experience. When we get traumatized, this area of the brain gets deactivated. So less blood flow, less activation. And so oftentimes when somebody with PTSD, you know, attempts to do talk therapy, for example, and they're struggling to put words to their experience um, or process verbally what they went through, this is possibly a reason why. It's because this area of the brain um, isn't activated properly. The neural pathways aren't firing properly because there's another priority happening and that's to keep you in survival mode. So that's why I am fascinated about body-based work in conjunction with talk therapy because we can start to retrain those neural pathways to regulate again. Um, there's so many other areas of the brain that get impacted. Um, I could talk, I literally could talk about this for days, um, but I wanted to highlight those two areas because I think that they are particularly relevant. Is there anything else that you would like me to share? No, that was perfect. I love that. That was uh, very well said. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited about the, the research findings that you've come across. Can you share with our listeners today some of those research findings? Yes, I'm, I'm so grateful that somebody's excited. Uh, oftentimes doing research related work can be very isolating work. Um, coupled with a pandemic, it feels sometimes like I'm the only one that's uh, looking at this. So I'm really grateful that you want to see it. I'm actually gonna share my screen if that's okay um, and share an image and kind of walk you through something that I've seen. Okay, so can you just let me know if you see the image? Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So this is um, a small sample of about five to 10 seconds of um, hooking an individual up to an ECG or an electrocardiography, electrocardiogram machine. And this measures your heartbeat. So what you're seeing on the top in red is a person's heartbeat. Okay, and what you're seeing in the line in the blue is the breath rate, like the breathing, so the respiration. And so just on the top, you'll see that this participant on the very top is an age match healthy uh, young adult who has never had a history of a clinical mental health condition, um, has not had any history of post-traumatic stress disorder. On the bottom, you're seeing a participant who has been clinically diagnosed with PTSD. And so if you just look at the red alone, you can see that you see this sort of grouping of close heartbeats together on the inhale with the participant with no PTSD. And then when they exhale, the beats start to spread out a little bit more. 
And then on the bottom, you just see this continuous um, heartbeat and, and breath rate with somebody who does have PTSD. So basically, this is looking at something called heart rate variability. And in a nutshell, an indicator of a healthy, regulated nervous system means that you have a high heart rate variability. And the person on the top, you can even just see visually, there is variability between the heartbeat. You see it quicken, you see it expand. And that's what we want. We want this variance of the heart to expand and contract with our breath. Somebody who doesn't have a high heart rate variability uh, just means that their heart is consistently beating at the same. That is an implication of um, health-related re health risk, cardiovascular-related risk, and mental health. So the person on the bottom who does have PTSD is just seeing that rapid heartbeat all the time. And so this is sort of proving this point that when we get traumatized, um, our body goes into this chronic state of dysregulation or anxiety or survival mode, if you will. And that's really reflected here uh, when we compare the two. So that's one exciting finding that I wanted to share. And it really visually, I think, shows what's going on. Um, other things that we looked at in the clinical trial, so it was an eight-week intervention, was looking at self-reported PTSD symptom severity, depression, anxiety, and we saw pretty incredible reductions in symptom severity, so about a 55% reduction after the eight-week program, uh, but it's not to say that PTSD was completely eradicated. Um, so more work, more continuous work definitely needs to be done, and, and we're exploring ways to expand uh, the clinical trial to be perhaps longer, um, to include different elements, etc. So mostly positive results, but we always can learn from research, and it's about building and building upon what you've done. Mm -hmm. Megan, for anyone who isn't familiar, uh, how would you describe somatic sensory practices and how can someone integrate these with talk therapy to heal PTSD and complex PTSD? Such a good question um, and one that I think we need to be asking more of. And it might be controversial for me to say this, but as somebody who's examining the physical impact of trauma, I really believe that talk therapy alone may not be the most effective approach for people. I'm not saying it's not effective, I'm saying in conjunction with talk therapy, we may wanna consider some somatic sensory based work. So somatic sensory work basically recognizes uh, that trauma imprints on our physical body. Okay, somatic sensory work, uh, aims to help an individual release tension, um, emotion, um, regulate the system through various types of body-based techniques. So it helps an individual become aware and conscious of their bodily sensations. One of the things I see very often is the presentation of dissociation with trauma. So this feeling of being separated from your body, kind of floating around or just not really fully feeling like you're in your body. And somatic sensory work really is helpful to help retrain and reconnect people back to mind and body connection. And so I really recommend um, anyone who might feel like they're still struggling, they still haven't quite figured out how to get themselves feeling better, to maybe seek out a trained uh, somatic sensory therapist um, or discover what body-based work feels releasing for you. Um, and I also will say, discover what body-based work feels uncomfortable for you. So if I may, what I'll say about that is, you know, we all have our, our physical activity that we go to that feels good. So some people walk, some people run, some people do CrossFit or kickboxing. You know, every, we all have something that we naturally tend towards. And one of the things that I do in my program is teach people to sit in mindfulness. And a lot of people say, oh, it's not for me. It's not for me. It's so uncomfortable. And so I would argue that part of your healing journey requires you to sit in the discomfort 
Um, and so my approach is to teach people to learn to not be afraid of what makes their body feel uncomfortable. Um, and oftentimes that means confronting really difficult emotions, difficult sensations. Um, yeah, so I would say find out something that feels good, but find out what makes you uncomfortable and, and see bit by bit if you can cultivate a practice in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and from my experience, um, you know, really getting into the body and releasing some of those emotions or sensations or, you know, experiences that are sort of held within the body has been so key. But I think it's also important to note that it's, it takes um, time and time again, a, you know, a, a constant uh, practice, which involves doing it over and over and over again, um, and releasing each time, you know, um, and with Absolutely. Everything. And you being a yoga instructor, and I, I'm just curious if you've had this experience, have you ever done like hip opening work and found that like you're either crying in the middle of the class or like afterwards you're quite emotional? Have you ever found that? Oh, absolutely. And, and even so, I find, you know, I'll, I, it's been years now of releasing emotions and I may think that I've made so much progress and then suddenly I'll be in a class and then I have that same emotional release or something that I didn't expect. So absolutely, yes. Yeah, well, and you're pointing on something so important that the healing journey is not linear, like it is up and down and all around and, and that's, that's part of it. So yeah, exactly. Bang on. For the listeners today, what would you say are two simple practices that they can try uh, when they're feeling that overactive nervous system response? Um, mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, just to uncover, so mostly when it comes to trauma healing, we're looking at ways to downregulate. So ways to soothe, calm, um, regulate the an overactive system, but there's also upregulation as well. So people who fall into that dissociative state or numbing, um, that um, feeling separated from their body state may also benefit from upregulation activities. But for today's talk, I'll kind of focus mostly on downregulation because I find that that's sort of the, the biggest priority is when we get triggered, our body goes into this overactive state. Um, so the first thing I'll say is, is to discover what makes you feel the most like yourself. I can sit here and, and suggest a few things, but really when it comes to your healing journey is really uncover what makes you feel soothed, calm, and grounded. Not numbed out, not avoidant, but actually in your body, present and calm. So, you know, are you a painter? Do you journal? Do you like to be in nature? Those are just things that I would recommend anyone kind of explore. But one of my favorite strategies that I teach very early on is this idea of tuning into your senses. So it's neurologically impossible for the brain to hold an anxious thought, a worry, or a fear while at the same time being in the present moment. This is proven, like we can't do both. So if you're festering or worrying, you're not here in the now. And so one of the quickest ways to kind of snap you out of that, I call it the hamster wheel, <laughs> to snap you out of that is to tune into your five senses. So you might stop what you're doing and look around your environment and, and focus in, like I've got you know a pen in front of me, but really focus in on the textures, the colors, um, you know, focus in on that. What do you hear? Sort of expand your hearing to the furthest away sound and gradually come to the closest sound what do you touch? What do you smell? What do you taste? And the moment we can kind of tune into those senses, we, we tame that hamster wheel a little bit. But just like you said, it means keep coming back to that over and over. It's not gonna, it's not gonna get you out of that right away. We got to keep practicing, just like you'd exercise and build a muscle with lifting a weight this. So that's a simple one, you can do it anywhere, anytime, whether you're on the subway, whether you're walking, it doesn't matter, you can, you can do that. Um, another few down regulation strategies I like, I, I like to talk a lot about the polyvagal theory, another, another topic for another time, 
but activating our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest system. So you might see people, you know, rub their lips slightly. So I kissing just feels so good, but we have a lot of sensory nerves in our lips that get us into that rest and digest relaxation mode. So touching your lips might be a quick thing that you do. Splashing cold water on your face or back of your neck, that cold sensation really does stimulate that relaxation response. And then something that I advocate a lot for is anchoring to your breath. Um, we underestimate the power of our breath and sometimes think, oh, this is too simple. How can this possibly do anything? But especially our exhale breath, when we exhale deeply and fully, and I mean like engage the core, we re-stimulate that rest and digest system. So anchoring to your breath, and it could be five breaths. It doesn't have to be 60 minutes like we sometimes see. It can be five breaths. I would say start with that. Mm -hmm. Megan, this has been so valuable. Thank you so much for sharing all those really, um, really key points. Um, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about your evidence-based program, Heal My Trauma. Um, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, but I'd love if you could just maybe give us some highlights about what the, the program entails or incorporates. Yeah, well, I think one of the amazing things when we first met is discovering that I had taken the trauma-sensitive yoga training course through um, I Am Yoga. And uh, this really is the foundation of the program. So um, participants go through eight weeks. Every week there is a specific trauma-sensitive yoga video. Um, nothing more than about 30 minutes. Uh, it's, it's not designed to stress you out. It's designed to complement your already busy life. Um, you have a daily guided meditation. You have over 56 meditations to choose from, all trauma-related, um, and then a breath technique manual. So a different technique each week to learn how to control your breath. Uh, one of my mantras, and I think I heard this from a past professional somewhere about um, when you control your breath, you contain your mind. And so we really work together on breath techniques and then every week we have a one hour call together where we explore the cognitive and emotional processing of trauma. Um, and that's through this Zoom platform so that people who, you know, this is accessible to anyone anywhere. They don't have to wait for eight months, um, like a lot of services in Ontario right now. And it just builds. There's journal prompts. There's, um, you know, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, lots of different, it's multimodal because I, I completely recognize that everyone's lived experience of trauma is different. I am learning alongside you as well. I'll never claim that I'm an expert in your trauma, but certainly here to walk along the journey with you and, and bear witness to your healing journey and recovery. Mm -hmm. Megan, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing all that you did. I think the work that you're doing is so valuable and so important, especially now with, you know, all kinds of things that are happening right now in our society. So I just want to thank you so much again for joining us on the chat. And uh, how can listeners connect with you at this time? Oh, well, I mean, the gratitude and appreciation is, is mutual. So again, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing for the community. Um, if people want to reach out to me, they can email me at info at healmytraumaimprint.com. Um, I'm learning the ropes of social media. So I'm on Instagram at healmytrauma. And uh, yeah, my website's healmytraumaimprint.com. So those are ways that you can get in touch. and. Um, yeah, happy to, happy to connect. Thank you so much. I loved having this conversation with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So what we're going to do now is we, we will open up the floor to any questions. So if anybody has a question at the moment, I do see some already. So that's wonderful. Um, for I'll get through some of the questions, but if you think of one, you can just type it into the chat box and we will get to it. So we have a, a question here from Helen who says, is there a quick exercise to upregulate? Mm -hmm. So upregulation like I said, is really, um, we don't talk about it as much as we do down regulation, but this is really beneficial for people who, like I said, 
struggle with dissociation or depersonalization and, and feel that disconnect, maybe feel like they're walking around, floating outside of their body, so to speak. So upregulation, um, what I would say is sensory or tactile based, you know, we see a lot of things like <laughs> fidget spinners, and I know those sometimes get a bad rap, but some kind of tactile, like whether it's Velcro, silk, um, different different textures and sensations to pull you back into your body. It sounds so simple, but certainly something that can get you um, back into the body a little bit more. Upregulation might look like, you know, dancing to your favorite song, uh, making an upbeat playlist. You know, we're trying to get the body into a certain level of arousal regulation, not over activated, but to amp up your motivation or amp up your feelings. So, you know, dancing, walking, fresh air, those are all ways that we can upregulate. Our next question is, uh, is there a good journal prompts, uh, a journal prompts or a workbook? Oh my gosh, I think we are in such an exciting time right now where there are incredible and vast amounts of trauma-related work that we can dive into. So to sit here and say there's one that's better than the other, I think I'd be doing a disservice, but certainly understanding and doing your research on what, is, what specific journal prompts are you looking for? Is it for trauma generally or something more specific? Um, there's a lot of fantastic um, influencers and thought leaders and therapists and healers uh, right now that are doing a lot of journal prompts around racialized trauma, which I find very fascinating um, and helpful. And um, there's awesome researchers like Bessel van der Kock and Peter Levine and um, the Trauma Justice Institute. Like there's lots of resources out there that have been created by researchers as well. So it's just doing your work a little bit more to specify what you're looking for. Um, lots of really great work out there. Uh, Janie Brown says, do you have any resources for somatic therapy that you could recommend? Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the things that I could recommend is a list of specialized therapists that do somatic therapy work. Um, I mean, I Am Yoga is, is also a fantastic um, organization that really promotes um, yoga as a therapeutic tool to help people recover from trauma. Um, so one of the best resources I did was sign up for the trauma sensitive yoga training and um, yeah, there's, there's a ton of resources. If you want to email me, um, I'm compiling a list, so I'm happy to send that out. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention, for those of you that are listening, um, the founder of I Am Yoga also created Blue Matter Project. So they are sort of two distinct uh, organizations, but they're very much affiliated. Um, but the, the training programs are with the Blue Matter Project. So uh, for anybody that is interested, the, the Blue Matter Project does have trainings, which uh, are postponed at the moment just because of COVID. And uh, those details will be share shared on the website and also in social media outlets. Mm -hmm. um, so just to return back to Karen, Karen, if you, um, we'd, we'd love it if you could just elaborate on your question, um, how, get more involved in what way, if you want to type that into the chat box. Um, yeah, I will add to Janie, I think it was Janie's question for somatic therapy. Um, if you look up TRE, um, lots of information about, and, and this is embedded in some of the yoga teachings, um, but also in somatic sensory based work. So different body based movements, different exercises to uh, release um, areas where there's tension. I firmly believe that emotion gets trapped in our body as well. So TRE, um, I'll put that in the box. TRE is, a, is an up and coming um, approach to releasing some of the physical imprints that trauma has on our body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for answering uh, with such detail, Megan. Um, one last comment from Janie Brown, who is actually involved in, in our trainings with Blue Matter Project, is that we're hoping to get started back in November. So please do stay up to date with us. You're welcome to sign up for the, uh, the newsletter with Blue Matter Project. Um, Megan, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm, I'm just so grateful to have this, this chat with you. I am so grateful and just really grateful for everyone that took the time out of their day to, to be here.